The upper limb and lower limb have numerous muscles that serve primarily for movement of the body and manipulation of objects. These muscles are organized into spaces called muscle compartments that are separated by fascia. Each compartment contains one or more functionally related muscles along with their nerve and blood supply. The muscles of the upper limbs are divided into anterior and posterior compartments, whereas the muscles of the lower limbs are divided into anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral compartments. These intramuscular septa, or thick fascia layers, separate the compartments. Compartment syndrome is where one of the muscles or blood vessels in a compartment becomes injured and the swelling compresses all the others. The fascia prevent the compartment from expanding with the increasing pressure. This pressure triggers a sequence of degenerative events. The blood flow to the compartment is obstructed by the pressure, which causes ischemia, and that persists for a couple hours to four hours. After that, the nerves will begin to die. After six hours, the muscle itself will begin to die. The nerves can regenerate after the pressure is relieved, but the muscle damage because of damage to the vessels is permanent. When you can see myoglobin in the urine, it indicates compartment syndrome. Myoglobin is a form of hemoglobin that's in the muscles that holds on to oxygen. Treatment for compartment syndrome involves immobilization of the limb and fasciotomy, which is an incision in the fascia layers to relieve pressure on the compartment. So the shoulder muscles originate on the axial skeleton and insert on the clavicle and scapula. The scapula is very loosely attached to the thoracic cage. It's capable of great movement. All these movements, rotation, elevation, depression, protraction, and retraction. The clavicle braces the shoulder and moderates these movements. The pectoralis minor is a small muscle beneath the pectoralis major on the front side. It originates on ribs three to five and inserts on the coracoid process of the scapula. This allows drawing of the scapula laterally. The serratus anterior muscles originate on ribs one through nine and insert on the medial border of the scapula. This allows abduction and rotation or depression of the scapula. There are four muscles on the posterior group that are involved in movement of the scapula. The trapezius is involved in stabilizing the scapula and the whole shoulder. It elevates and depresses the shoulder apex. The levator scapulae elevates the scapula as well as flexing the neck laterally. There are two rhomboideous muscles. There's the rhomboideous minor, which retracts the scapula and braces the shoulder, as well as the rhomboideous major, which assumes the same function as the rhomboideous minor. This figure summarizes all the muscles acting on movement of the scapula. For lateral rotation, we'll see the trapezius and the serratus anterior. For elevation, the levator scapulae, the trapezius, and both rhomboid muscles. For medial rotation, we'll see the levator scapulae, rhomboids major and minor. For depression, the trapezius and the serratus anterior for protraction, pectoralis minor and serratus anterior, and for retraction, rhomboids, major and minor, and trapezius. This is a good exercise to go through what causes each of these movements. Think about the muscles, where they originate, and where they insert, and see if you can paint yourself a good picture. Now we'll move into the muscles acting on the arm. There are nine muscles that cross the shoulder joint and insert on the humerus. Two are axial muscles because they originate on the axial skeleton. These are the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi. The pectoralis major flexes, adducts, and medially rotates the humerus, whereas the latter, latissimus dorsi does the opposite. It adducts and medially rotates the humerus towards the back side of the body. 
There are seven scapula muscles. They originate on the scapula. There's the deltoid muscle that rotates and adducts the arm. And it's a good site for intramuscular injections. There is the teres major muscle that acts to medially rotate and extend the humerus. There's the coracobrachialis, which flexes and medially rotates the arm. And the remaining four form the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff reinforces the shoulder joint. The rotator cuff muscles are called the sits muscles for the first letter of each of their names. We have the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. The tendons of these muscles merge with the joint capsule of the shoulder as they cross it en route to the humerus. These hold the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity. The supraspinatus is the one that's most easily damaged in rotator cuff injuries. Now let's look at some of the muscles that act on the forearm. The elbow and the forearm are capable of flexion, extension, pronation, and supination. These are carried out by the muscles of the brachium, or the arm, and the antebrachium, the forearm. Muscles with their bellies in the brachium are the prime, principal elbow flexors and principal elbow extensors. The elbow flexors are in the anterior compartment and include the brachialis and the biceps brachii. The brachialis produces 50% more power than the biceps brachii, so it is the prime mover of elbow extension. The triceps brachii is in the posterior compartment, and it's the principal elbow extensor. It's the prime mover for elbow extension. There are muscles with their bellies in the forearm, or the antebrachium. These muscles act on the hand and the wrist. There's the brachioradialis, the anconius, which both flex and extend the elbow, the pronator quadratus, which is the prime mover in forearm pronation, pronator teres, which assists the pronator quadratus in pronation, and then the supinator. Let's look at these muscles. We have the triceps brachii in the posterior compartment of the arm. It involves three different heads, the lateral head, the long head, and the medial head, hence the name triceps. We also have the brachialis. Remember, brachialis is the prime mover. It lays just below the biceps brachii. Biceps brachii is the predominant muscle that you can palpate in your upper arm. The brachioradialis goes from the brachium down to the radius. The biceps muscle also has two heads. It has a long head as well as a short head. Now let's look at the muscles in the forearm. We had the supinator muscle, the pronator teres, as well as the pronator quadratus. They're involved in supination and pronation of the forearm. Here's a cross section looking into the compartments of the upper limb. We have a superficial anterior or flexor compartment, a deep anterior or flexor compartment where we see the brachialis here beneath biceps brachii. And then on the posterior side, we have an extensor compartment and then some other muscles. So we see here in the posterior compartment, the three heads of the triceps brachii. So let's look at some of the anterior muscles that act on the wrist and the hand. The extrinsic muscles of the forearm and the intrinsic muscles are in the hand itself. The extrinsic muscle actions involve flexion and extension of the wrists and digits, as well as radial and ulnar flexion, finger abduction and adduction, and thumb opposition. So now we're looking at muscles on the anterior side of the forearm. And so they'll flex the fingers or the carpal bones. So the flexor carpi radialis is the flexor muscle that comes down and inserts on the radial side. The flexor 
carpi ulnaris is going to insert on the ulnar side. The flexor digitorum superficialis is a superficial muscle that is going to insert on the digits. Now the deep layer in the anterior compartment contains the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor pollicis longus. Looking at all three layers, the superficial, intermediate, and deep flexors, we can get a more clear view of the muscles in the forearm. Now there are lots of muscles in the forearm. And I do want you to identify these in Anatomy and Physiology Revealed because we won't have the opportunity to identify them in the cat. Now let's look at the posterior muscles acting on the wrist and hand. These are involved in extension of the wrist and fingers. So they adduct and abduct the wrist as well as extension and abduction of the thumb. In the posterior extensor compartment or in the superficial layer, we'll see the extensor carpi radialis longus. So that will insert on the radial side, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, the extensor digitorum, the extensor digiti minimi is going to be involved in extending the minimi digit, the little finger, and the extensor carpi ulnaris will insert on the ulnar side. Now the deeper layer, we have the adductor pollicis longus, we have the extensor pollicis brevis, the extensor pollicis longus, and then the extensor indices, which extends the index finger. Although you need to know all of these muscles in the forearm, I'm going to let you off the hook for knowing all the intrinsic muscles of the hand. So as you can see, on the anterior side of the hand, there are many tendons that pass through into the palm. They pass through a little tunnel called the carpal tunnel. You'll have noticed on the skeletal section that there are some bones with processes on them that create sort of a channel through there. And they are all held in place in this tunnel by the flexor retinaculum. And this is the site where we see the issues with carpal tunnel syndrome. The flexor retinaculum is like a bracelet that covers up all these tendons and holds them in the channel as they pass through to the hand. Each of these tendons are enclosed in tendon sheath, which allow the tendons to slide back and forth quite easily beneath the retinaculum. In carpal tunnel syndrome, we see that repetitive or prolonged motions in the wrist and fingers can cause these tissues to become inflamed or swollen. This puts pressure on the median nerve of the wrist that passes through the carpal tunnel, and it causes a tingling and muscular weakness in the palm and the medial side of the hand. The pain can radiate into the arm and shoulder. Now, the only real treatment is anti-inflammatory drugs and immobilization of the wrist. Sometimes surgery can be used to remove part of the flexor retinaculum, but really most of it can be happened with rehabilitation. Now, here's a quick look at the intrinsic hand muscles. There's a thenar group, a hypothenar group, and a mid-palma group. You don't need to know any of these muscles. I think they're intensely difficult to find, but do be aware that there are each of these different groups and an inordinate number of muscles more that we could be learning. So at this point, again, check in with your outline and make sure you have all of the components in there for the shoulder, through the arm, and into the hand. And our final section will involve the pelvis and lower limb.